Thank you. Um, I'm Kathy Gellis. I am a solo cyber lawyer in Sausalito. Um, I'm also a contributor at Tech Dirt, and one of the things I do is I like to advocate for free speech on the internet, and in order to protect free speech on the internet, that means I end up advocating for a law called Section 230. And you've been hearing a lot of Section 230 in the news, mostly with people saying, let's kill it, let's get rid of it, all these terrible things are on the internet, it's all Section 230's fault, let's overturn it, fix it, modify it, kill it, nuke it, salt it from the earth, whatever. This is a bad idea, and I'm going to try to explain why this is a really awesome law. So we're going to do Think of the Kitten. Please raise your hand if you like to look at cat pictures on the internet. That is a significant number of hands, although I must ask about the ones of you who didn't raise your hand, but that's okay. A number of people. All right, raise your hand if you like the dog pictures. Raise your hands if you like both. Okay, fine. Raise your hand if you like neither. Okay, there's some of you, this is good to know. Um, where do online cat pictures come from? The answer is, it's user-generated content. In other words, this is content that is produced by people other than the platform where you're experiencing the cat picture things. This other, oh, we've disappeared from the display. Oh no. Is that me? Oh, now it came back. Okay, fine. I threatened it. Okay. Cat pictures on the internet. We can see how important it is. We need our cat pictures. Um, this is a tweet from a friend this morning. The perils of working from home. She's covered in cat. Sometimes the cats like to speak for themselves. This is one of my favorite cat Twitter accounts, Parkin. Parkin lives in England, and Parkin really likes beef and naps. Sometimes their cat flaps can speak for them, uh, have something to say. Um, this is a friend's cat flap that is programmed with a Raspberry Pi to track whenever the cat comes in um, the house and then tweet about the cat coming in and out of the house. And sometimes we have things we want to say about the cats in our lives. This is a Twitter account. Um, this is a tweet to a Twitter account called The Cat Reviewer, where people discuss the cats that they've met uh, out and about and report back in and rate them for floofiness and cuteness and other important uh, cat attributes. But without Section 230, we wouldn't get any of this. All we would end up with is cats by Disney. Let's not have that world. We want to keep our diversity of felines, of our puppies, of our spiders and snakes and all sorts of other cute and interesting creatures. This is what keeps the internet interesting. We need this law. So I'm going to explain why. This cat is in a time machine, let's pretend. And we're going to go way, way back to the mid-1990s. And because I'm a lawyer, I like to talk about law things, but I want to make them not scary so you can understand. In the 90s, um, there were a couple things that were happening. One of which was Congress was really worried about all the porn on the internet. Think of the kitten, they were like, think of the children. There's terrible things out there, we must get rid of all the porn. Meanwhile, there was also something else that happened. There was a court case called Stratton Oakmont versus Prodigy. Do you guys remember Prodigy? Raise your hand if you remember Prodigy. That's a good amount. That's kind of the cat picture amount. But um, Prodigy was, a dial-up bullet board service. Um, I, at this point in time, I don't know if it was actually connected to the wider internet, but people would dial in and talk to each other. They had message boards, and somebody went on one of the message boards and posted something about a potential soon-to-be plaintiff who decided that that was defaming him, and he wanted to sue. But he didn't try to sue, or maybe he did, but that wasn't the point. He, the speaker of the message that he thought was defamatory, he decided it was Prodigy's fault. How dare you, Prodigy, offer up a message board where somebody could type something that defamed me? How dare you? And they tried to sue, and there was a decision. It's an unpublished decision, but it was a state court case in New York where the judge is like, yep, sounds good for me. Prodigy's totally potentially on the hook for the stupid stuff their users do. So there were a couple other people in Congress, um, Representative, then Representative Chris Cox and current now Senator Ron Wyden, who was also Senator then, were like, this is gonna be a problem. Because even back in the mid 90s, Prodigy had a gazillion pieces of user generated content hitting its systems. How on earth could it possibly deal with like 
is it even gonna know if any of the content is defamatory? How would it possibly police this? There's just way too much stuff. Um, but meanwhile, those two things happened where these Congress people were worried about that problem and Senator Exxon was worried about the porn and the kind of the two merged together and that turned into the Communications Decency Act of 1996. But then the following year, there was a lawsuit, Reno versus ACLU, and the upshot of Reno versus ACLU is that A, the First Amendment applies to online spaces as much as they do off, and B, most of the Communications Decency Act was unconstitutional because it violated the First Amendment when it came to the internet. So that struck out most of it, but what was left standing was Section 230. And it's been on the books since the mid-90s and chugging along for 20 years, doing pretty well up until about last year when we messed it up. Um, but so talking about what's in it. So when Chris Cox and Senator Wyden were getting together, they put in a lot of like warm, fuzzy language about it. And I'll just go through a couple quick slides, but basically it's, Congress finds that the internet is actually really a cool place. There's lots of neat things going on. It's helping people learn stuff, um, exchange information. This is all great. These are the findings. And then they talk about it's the policy of the United States to make sure that we can still have this. We want, and this is Congress's policy, the most good stuff online and the least bad. So now the question is, how do we get it? Here we are. This is the big crux of Section 230, this one little paragraph. And it looks really scary, and I've tried to read it out loud before in presentations, and it just sounds terrible, so I'll leave you to read it. But I'll translate it. Um, Basically, whoever posts the crap on the internet is responsible for the crap they post on the internet, but not the tool they use to post it. This is a huge statement. A um, Couple things to note. One, it doesn't mean that nobody's responsible. Whoever made the content crappy is liable for how crappy they made it. Assuming it violates a law, then they are responsible for it. But here's what goes back to the Stratton Notebook versus Prodigy problem of how could the platform possibly take responsibility? They can't know always if it's wrongful. They can't possibly catch it, even if they could tell it's wrongful. There's just way too much stuff. And if they had to fear letting something appear on their platform that might be legally wrongful, they'll just not let anything on their platform. They'll end up censoring an awful lot of content or not existing as platforms to help people speak to each other at all. And we won't get the good stuff on the internet, including the cat pictures. We need Section 230 in order to make sure those cat pictures can stay up. There is a parallel provision in, um, in Section 230, and we don't talk about this one as much, and sometimes this is also picked up in that first provision. But remember, Congress wanted two things, the most good stuff and the least bad stuff. So we've made it safe by giving the platforms immunity for leaving up something that might be bad. We also make it safe for them to try to take stuff down. Congress wanted the platforms to help get rid of all the crap that's on the internet, and we had to make it safe for them to do so. So what Section 230 does is it, it's an all carrot, no stick thing. It's not like you'll be punished if you do it wrong. We've aligned the incentives to make the platforms partners with that congressional policy of the most good and the least bad, and that's the wisdom and the magic of 230. And that's why if we start dorking with it a little bit, or heaven forbid, get rid of it entirely, we change that whole calculus, because you don't want the platforms to be scared. If they're scared to leave up content, they won't get rid of the cat pictures, uh, they will get rid of the cat pictures, and if they're scared to take stuff down, it actually forces them into a position where they won't do the moderation we really want. Um, anyway, so here we go. I just want to give you a scenic tour so you're not afraid of law, because law is pretty cool. Um, one other section of this is the definitions. Um, we talked about the platform is the tool that people are using to speak to each other, and then you also have the user who's posting things. And there's only two definitions in this whole statute. Um, the one on the bottom, number three, is that's the user who's posted the content. They're responsible for things. And number two is the interactive computer service. This is, I'm using the word, the, the platform, it's the Twitter, it's the Facebook, it's the Google, um, but it can actually be quite broad uh, about who is protected by Section 230. We think about it in our public discourse and the debates, people are talking about, well, Facebook is protected, and that's generally true. Twitter's protected. Consumer review sites like Yelp and Glassdoor are protected. E-commerce platforms like Amazon and Airbnb can be protected. Um, common sections on 
news articles are protected, search engines are protected because the stuff that's flowing through the search engine is not produced by them. A, a link that they link to is created by somebody else. Payment providers, email providers, ISPs who are brokering the entire exchange of information on the internet, bulletin board services, and you. Sometimes I talk about, like, if you forward an email, um, if there's something wrong with that email, you may not have made the thing that was wrong in the email, you just forwarded it along. And there are cases that say that Section 230 applies to you. If you have a Facebook post and you take comments on your Facebook page and somebody posts something stupid or terrible and illegal on your Facebook page, um, you're not liable for that because it wasn't your content, that was something that uh, somebody else um, created. Although, let me introduce the, yes, I am a lawyer, I am not your lawyer. If I were your lawyer, we would have signed a letter and you probably would have given me some money. So, not legal advice here. Um, there's a couple of things to point out about Section 230. There's a section that deals with exemptions. We are going to ignore this particular one, which says that there's a law called ECPA, and here they had to put in there might have been a collision between ECPA and 230, and there's like, nope, no collision, let's move on. Here's another important one. It's not really an exception, but basically what this means is that Congress has spoken. The internet inherently crosses state lines, and, um, and we don't want to have states mucking it up. We decided that immunity was important, and we don't want states to come up with laws where when they craft their state law, they've somehow changed this relationship where if you had a platform and somebody in Arizona saw it, that, and they thought there was something wrong with the content that Arizona law would let you sue the platform. So this is a preemption clause that says states sit this out, the internet is inherently interstate commerce, the market is crossing state lines, Congress has got this, states go away. This is an important provision. It always exempted, if the thing that was wrong with the content is that it violated federal criminal law, Section 230 never, ever, ever applied to the platforms. Um, state criminal law, the preemption provision, would protect the platforms because the state law can't affect that. But federal criminal law, Section 230 was useless. And that's really important for things like a lot, of, some of the sex crimes, sex trafficking, um, some of the really own, child porn and things like that, the really disgusting stuff that is truly problematic and socially problematic. Um, it, it tends to reach a degree where federal law is actually speaking to it. And in that case, no protection for the platforms. So it always sort of meant that the platforms actually had to police, but just for this one thing. And it meant that they could do a much better job at it because they could focus on this really salacious, terrible stuff um, because they didn't have to worry about moderating for any other forms of liability that might crop up. But then we went and I said we mucked up Section 230. Last, uh, I guess we're about two years ago now, um, they passed a bill called FOSTA. You might have also heard it called SESTA. That was a name that was getting used while it was roaming through Congress. And it, you can kind of see just like, you don't want to read that paragraph. That looks ugly, doesn't it? I'm a lawyer, I don't want to read that paragraph. That's really ugly and hard to parse. They changed the criminal law to such an extent that it has now stripped Section 230 immunity, but it's really confusing to figure out why, and the upshot of it is, um, and arguably they were going after sex trafficking, which arguably you didn't need to change 230 to do because federal criminal law was already there, but they went to sex trafficking, and as a result, a bunch of platforms started censoring content. Um, cat pictures have stayed up, but a lot of Craigslist ad sections have come down, uh, dating, sites have gone down, um, sex workers themselves, like a lot of them were advertising online, they can't advertise online, so now they've been driven into the streets where they're actually getting killed, this is bad. We haven't, you know, been trying to save people, we actually hurt people. Um, this was a big problem. There is a constitutional challenge to it that's working its way through the courts, um, but we're not gonna have a miracle cure to it, to it. This was something that we did a live experiment in production for what the law should do, and it's not working out well, and there's collateral damage. People have been hurt, lawful speech has been taken down, and this is why I come to you and say, let us not mock up with the statute any further. And we already knew this was gonna be a problem because we had already carved out another thing. If the thing that was wrong with the content was that it viled, violated intellectual property law, like copyright, Section 230 was also useless. No protection for the platforms. So this has always put platforms in a position of having to sort of like 
overly censored content. Now, they do have some protection. It's called the DCMA, Section 512. Um, and this section of, I know you can't read it, it's just one teeny little section of the DMCA that if they want any protection, it is extremely technical and conditional. And the upshot of it is, it's very difficult for platforms. They tend to have to, if they get a takedown notice, even if the takedown notice is abusive and garbage, they tend to have to take down first and that's the end of it. And a lot of legitimate lawful content ends up coming down. You can see I'm wearing my my sector, uh, this content is not available due to a copyright notice complaint. I mean, this is now the world we're living in where the internet is turning into Swiss cheese and we're losing our cat pictures. So, I've ended this slightly early, so I'm going to leave this open for questions because one of the things is, this is a big policy area. You'll hear every single candidate, every single congressperson, presidents, they're all talking about Section 230 because the reality is there is bad stuff on the internet. And it's not to say that we should just, pff, whatever, have all the bad stuff. But um, while I was sitting here, a friend of mine tweeted, she said, you know, the problem is people suck and tech helps people suck at scale. And I was thinking about that and... <laughs> and she is not wrong, but that's not the end of the story. Tech also helps the good in us succeed. It helps make our relationships. Seven billion of us can talk to each other around the world. We have never lived at a time where seven billion of us could connect to people. We can talk to people and form relationships and form communities. We can come together. We can be charitable. We can be good. We can be sociable. We can exchange knowledge. We can exchange our pictures of our cats from continents away from each other. This is a good thing, and no matter how frustrated we are with some of the bad stuff, the solution is not to do something which will prevent us from getting the good stuff, and that's the message I want to leave you with. Keep the cat pictures, think of the kid, and support Section 230. Thank you. Aha, a question. Oh, and somebody wave when I need to stop. So, yeah. Well, I'm just going to use my outdoor voice. Um, why does Section 230 NCO muck with them in the first place, and what can we as non-lawyers, other power congressmen, do to help it get fixed? Excellent question. Uh, I will be very brief, so therefore imperfect in the answer. There was a collision of a lot of forces that sort of picked up on the political moment to come together and that ended up, there were some people who are truly sex advocates, actually there's some sex advocates who were like we should never have done this, but there were some sex advocates who genuinely thought this might be a good idea even though there was evidence to the contrary. There's Hollywood with a lot of the copyright concerns that they have, which I will just insert very cynical comments here. Um, they recognized an opportunity to put the pressure on platforms because they resent the platforms because they've They've lowered the need to have gatekeepers. We don't need our cats to be delivered by Disney. Disney doesn't get a market in charging us for cat pictures when we can supply the cat pictures to each other. And a lot of those interests came together. Um, and then, you know, it sort of hits the zeitgeist and politicians like to make sure that, like, they're doing something, bad things were on the internet, and they felt like they needed to be responsive to their constituents, that they were doing something about it, and they kind of went along for the ride. Um, there's not necessarily the tech savvy in Congress that you really need for them to be able to parse through whether this is a good idea or not. So keep telling them that you like it, that Section 230 is good. If they hear that more often, that will start being meaningful. Um, oh. Okay, we got good time. Go ahead. All right. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the role of Section 230 in Earn It? The, uh, the, the Lindsey Graham. Wow, that's thing. a rip from the headlines right from uh, today. Um, I will try. I haven't fully read the bill. Um, the question was, so I talked about there's a bunch of efforts going through Congress right now to amend Section 230, different proposals, and Senator Graham basically this week proposed a bill called Earn It. And this is now the Frankensteinian monster of uh, cyber policy because he's going after two things. One, Section 230 has become a popular whipping boy, so they're going to try to get rid of that. Um, two, there's all the impetus to say, there's a frustration in the DOJ and some other members of Congress to say, 
what do you mean we can't have back doors? Um, so I imagine many of you are familiar with some of the crypto debates, but police don't like the idea that there might be some devices that they can't penetrate. And I can't poo-poo that, that's obviously you know, a policing concern, but there's obviously some really important civil liberties and general cyber protection um, and public cybersecurity issues and making sure that encryption works and encryption won't work when we start poking holes in it. Once you poke the hole, you, you're not a little bit pregnant, you're not a little bit secure, like it's either or. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, this bill has tried to tether these two ideas where if you don't give the back doors, you don't get your Section 230 protection. It's a little bit more complicated in terms of how it parses, but this is bad news. Um, people have not written about it. I'm pretty sure a post has just gone up on TechDirt. I'm gonna plug Rihanna Pfefferkorn at Stanford. She's written a soliloquy and has a whole bunch of uh, tweets about it. Um, I mean, one I saw today was pointing out that we have legitimate and governmentally recognize real needs for encryption. Like, what about our health data? And this idea that, like, because we're unhappy that bad guys may use the tools, we, nobody gets it. Um, I mean, it, one of the things that tends to ripple through cyber debates is bad guys use the tools. And so there's a regulatory reaction to say, well, let's take the tools away from them. But you can't take the tools away from them without taking the tools away from everybody. We can understand as a society that just because people you know, break windows with hammers, we don't ban hammers. But that's much harder for regulators to understand in terms of internet tools. Some people may misuse them, but that doesn't mean we all lose recess. Um, we need to be able to keep them. Do you have a question? Thank you for gracing with all the cat pictures. Okay. Really appreciate it. Um, you could say like Section 230 was like written back in like the Internet 1.0 era, mm -hmm. where Congress couldn't really foresee what the Internet would become. So standing there, what, 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 could, what, could, what would you say, like what would you change about Section 230 to make it more applicable to the Internet today? Or what would you improve on it, you know? Okay, so the I tip back to the slides to talk about the findings section. So at your leisure, you may want to pull up Section 230 look at section A and look at section B because you look at how Congress spoke about it and what they basically did is they couldn't tell what it would become but they kind of had a sense of all this potential so they wrote something that was actually really flexible so it doesn't, it could grow into being whatever you wanted. It could really, if we had all decided we really liked mass fax services, it could have applied to a mass fax service. Um, but they gave it the flexibility, it could apply to all sorts of platforms, um, providing all sorts of services, including things that we never could have envisioned back then. And that's the good thing, so I wouldn't mess with that. And if I were gonna improve anything, uh, well first I would get rid of all the FOSTA editions because that's been junk and hurtful and we know it. Um, but I would get rid of Oops. This one, the no effect on intellectual property law. It's cut a gigantic hole in that immunity and we can see the sensorial evidence. We can see how much legitimate, lawful, necessary content ends up taking a hit and that's bad. And I, it was kind of complicated politics for why they ended up um, uh, including this, this hole, but um, it was, I think it was a mistake. I think it's caused harm that's been observable and I would, if I could have my way and snap my fingers, I'd get rid of that whole clause and just let section 230 apply to everything. Am I safe on time to take another? Okay, all right, thanks very much.